Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt. And I'm Tim. We like to explore why we do what we do with some of the smartest and brightest people in the world so we can learn from them and share some of that knowledge with you, our listeners. As always, we are excited about our guest today. But before we begin, we wanted to let you know that we are trying out some new things here at Behavioral Grooves. Ah, yes. World headquarters is plenty busy these days, let me tell you. (laughs) If you haven't already noticed, we have moved our standard release date, and we're experimenting with some other dates as well. So we're trying to see if there is a day of the week that seems to work best for our listeners to download and listen to our episodes. We're also going to be doing more produced series, and we have three special series in the works for 2022. Hopefully they all get done. Um, These are big undertakings for us and they require a lot of extra production as well as upfront work. But we are super excited about them and hope that you will be too. We'll let you know more about these as we get closer to the release dates for them. Yeah, we are also exploring collaborative efforts with other podcasters and academic communities. And to start with, we're partnering with Andy Luttrell from Opinion Science on one of these series that Kurt talked about just now. And by the way, if you're not listening to the Opinion Opinion Science Podcast, we urge you to check it out. Partnerships and collaborations are important to us. So let us know what you'd like to see and who you'd like to see us work with. Finally, we are experimenting in the next few weeks, maybe months, with some short focus sessions that we are calling Groove Tracks or Grooving Tracks. We're not quite sure on the name yet. Maybe you can let us know which one's better or if they're both suck and we need something else. But these will be, you know, five, 10 minute grooving sessions where we go deep into a research paper or a single topic. And we're super excited about these, not just because they're cool, but because we're going to record them with video and then post them out on YouTube. So you get to see our not made for television faces. <laughs> So while we have already created a YouTube channel, and I know that a lot of people already listen on YouTube, those videos are just static images. The new groove tracks or grooving tracks, whichever it's going to be, will actually be live videos of Kurt and me talking to each other. And thankfully, they'll only last like five or 10 minutes. So people won't, hopefully will be able to put up with our mugs for that much time. <laughs> <laughs> so keep an eye out for grooving tracks or groove tracks or groovy, groovy, groovy tracks. I don't know, whatever it is. And let us know what you think about them. We are experimenting because we want to make sure that this podcast is the best possible way to get the behavioral science insights that you want in a style that is both fun, refreshing, hopefully not too, you know, uh, crazy and having to look at our ugly mugs. But hey, that's that's what it is. So there we go. All right. Let, let's let's move on to this episode. <laughs> good, good, good idea. Okay, today's guest is Dr. Paul Zeitz. Dr. Zeitz is a physician, an epidemiologist, and a long-standing advocate for justice and human rights, including and specifically about children's rights. Paul is known for his extreme optimism, which he used to help establish global programs to combat AIDS, TB, and malaria. Paul's determination led the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief and an annual budget of $5 billion, saving the lives of more than 40 million people. Paul is the author of Waging Justice and Waging Optimism, and his latest book is Waging Love. He is focused on creating a movement in the U.S. to create more just and a better world for everybody. Yeah, and so we hope that you sit back with a cool draft of optimism, justice, and love and listen to our conversation with Dr. Paul Zeitz. Paul Zeitz, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Great to be here. Thank you. We are, as always, excited to have you, Paul. And as we talked about at the beginning, we're going to do a speed round. I'm lucky enough to get the first speed round question. Are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? Both. Both. I drink coffee. I have to have a cup of coffee soon after I wake up, even before a workout. I must have a coffee. (laughs) Um, You know, I don't usually drink coffee more than once a day. I try not to anyway. And I do go to like green tea. I do. I have had tea phases where I only drink tea for like a period of several months and drop the coffee, you know. So I, I experiment and play. Okay, well, good. We like that. An equal opportunity caffeine guy. <laughs> Not really. I think no. coffee, <laughs> okay. coffee has a distinct uh, lead in this dynamic. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> okay, uh, which is better, dinner with Alicia Keys or Desmond Tutu? <laughs> That's an impossible question. I have had the blessed opportunity to directly work with both of these folks. Uh, they're both big souls and big hearts. Arch, as you know, passed away recently. Yeah. And I've been in connection with his family, his daughter in Poe, and so many people have been touched by Arch. He went by Arch, you know, um, and I worked with him. He had an iPhone, like, as one of the first iPhones, you know, and I would send him messages, text messages, and I would be texting my wife and Arch, like, on the same device, and he would re always respond faster than Mindy. <laughs> I was like, Mindy, Arch is... Responding faster than you, dear. Can you <laughs> name a little? <laughs> um, Hello. <laughs> he was really phenomenal. And I've been really reflecting on like the, like, I feel like, first of all, his spirit is alive within all of us and within me right now. I'm connecting to him. He had like this incredible joy field. He saw everything as beautiful and as possibility. And he, walked, he really kind of was an essence of joy. And then within that space of joy, he was the hardest-nosed, tenacious advocate. Um, and he, like, we worked together on challenging George Bush. And then we had to do the same thing for President Barack Obama. And that was a tough ask. But he, he didn't hesitate for a split second. And I heard at the time from, you know, some officials that that was not well-received. Mm -hmm. yeah set the president, you know, that Arch was like on the, you know, challenger mode in the USA Today and in the Washington Post, you know, with an opinion piece, you know, yeah. you know, and we did that kind of tactic as a last resort. You know, we try to offer our leaders opportunities to lead. But if you're not going to get with the program, you know, we're going to hold you accountable. If you're going to say something and do something else, then yeah. the gun, you know, we're not going to sit by. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is kind of a lead in now. You kind of talked a little bit about this. So in America, should we stay with our current constitution or should we move to version 2.0? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Listen, I grew up in Philadelphia and as a young boy, every year, multiple times a year, we went down to Independence Mall, into Independence Hall. I touched the Liberty Bell many, many times as a young boy when it was housed inside of Independence Hall. Yep. Now they moved it into this little place and you can't really touch it. So I have a deep attachment to the history and the moment of the creation of our country in Philadelphia from, you know, set from the 1700s through the time the Constitution was approved in 1787. And I have, you know, I, I'm a closet historian, so I haven't told anyone that yet. So, you know, kind of. Uh -oh. <laughs> All right. You know, well, sorry to out you on the show, but there you yeah. go. Yeah. So what I learned from that as an early child, I remember going to the Trinity Church, where George Washington went, and walking along there, I'm like, that icon of a human actually sat in this pew. Yeah, like he that he was just a human, you know. And they were humans living at a time, and they uh, actually just wrote a piece of paper. A couple of them, they wrote, they decided to write the Declaration of Independence. They were just people living in their time in a situation that they thought was unworkable, and they wanted to create the next possibility. So. They wrote a piece of paper, Declaration of Independence. Then a few year, a decade or so later, before the internet, they, uh, you know, uh, they did the Articles of Confederation, and uh, we operated under that from se till 1787, and when the Constitution was approved, and it was again, it was they came in to modify the Articles, mm -hmm. and they decided it was unfixable, uh, so they had to create the next iteration of a govern uh, a constitutional order. So they wrote in. People wrote, took a pen and wrote on paper, and they created a new constitutional order. It's like actually that easy. It's there's no, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, people do it all the time. Ecuador has a new constitution that includes respecting the environment. South Africa, where Arch and uh, Nelson Mandela, they had a new constitution after apartheid. So this happens all the time. The Florida State Constitution requires updates every ten years mm -hmm. for amending. So. This constitutional order, uh, the constitution that was written, is working really well. It was designed by white male uh, slave owners who were uh, oppressing, by design, women and people of color. And if you look at its effect, 
however number of years later, it's actually working like a charm. It's actually amazing. <laughs> it's like we are living in an, an environment where women are oppressed and people of color are oppressed by systematic design. And there's a group of folks trying to keep it that way. And there's most of us, the majority of Americans, uh, principled Republicans, independents. I'm a registered independent, always have been, probably always will be. And, uh, you know, maybe the Democrats and all the other affiliated parties. Most importantly, the non-voting Americans, I believe, you know, believe that we can do better than what we're doing now. So I, I do believe we need a new constitution. We have to kind of start over <laughs> to <laughs> America 2.0. It's not that big of a deal. I believe that when the moment is right, when we can create a movement of Americans, we could do this in 10 days. Wow. Wow. Oh, man. I think that might be a little bit difficult, but I think there's a there's a I, I love the idea of being able to say, look, we can change. Right. And this is a positive piece of this. But but this is the speed round. I know it seems crazy oh, for our listeners. But no, this is Paul. It's OK. We have this. I don't know. Not every time, oh, but there are a vast number time. of times where the speed round goes much longer than the actual interview goes. So anyway, we have one last question. And Tim, that's yours. And you teed it up actually, actually really just perfectly there because uh, you have described SIPO as a disease, right? Yes, yes. Is this a disease that we want to catch or vaccinate against? Okay. So I'm a physician by training. I went to medical school. I got certified. I'm board certified in preventive medicine. And as a physician, I don't practice clinical medicine. I do public policy and look at the health of the population, both you know, in our country and globally. So I basically have an opportunity and maybe a responsibility to identify affections or Ill I don't know if it's necessarily a disease. It's an I'm affected by something called SIPO. Uh, it's self-imposed persistent optimism. SIPO, S-I-P-O, self-imposed persistent optimism. And I have, as a physician, I am obligated to let you know that if you are exposed to SIPO, it is highly contagious. It, there is no known treatment or cure. There is no vaccine and no preventive modality that can oppose it. So you're be forewarned that you may become persistently optimistic if you choose. You know, it is a choice. So tell us a little bit more about SIPO, because this is yeah. a really fascinating concept that you've written about in your books and different pieces of yeah. this. But all right, it feels like it's an interesting worldview. And even in the most troubled times, people can have this. So what is it and what does it achieve? Well, I was writing my first book, uh, Waging Justice, as a memoir. And then I spent about a year and a half running around the country, did 40 events in all kinds of venues and explaining the book. And then what I realized, I actually figured SIPO out during that kind of process that I thought I realized I, I, I don't know how I did what happened without purposefully generating myself as persistently optimistic in the face of the circumstances that I was facing. You know, I went to the cauldrons of humanity. I saw the worst possible scenarios directly face up. I lived in Zambia and all, traveled all over Africa during the heyday of the AIDS pandemic when uh, the people were dropping dead like flies. People that were our age, economically productive adults, young people, 15 to 44, Actually, I'm older than that now. I used to be able to say that <laughs> when I'm in that zone. I'm actually turning 60 this year. So that was a little bit of a, you know, I have to be authentic and honest with you. You know, and every I got, I said, we need $10 billion a year to end global AIDS. And everyone said, you're crazy, Paul Zeitz. My peers laughed at me, literally, from respectable organizations. I won't name them. And I, like, had to, like, face the, this kind of blowback. And uh, I sometimes call it naysaying. And uh, in the face of that, I always stand for possibility. So I stood for the possibility that we could have a multi-billion dollar investment to uh, save lives. And it worked. And I wasn't alone. It was me as a member of a broad global movement really coming from the ground or were directly affected people in the United States and globally, like the ACT UP folks, they were directly affected a activists on the ground in Africa and Latin America and Europe, all over Japan. So, yeah, that movement uh, showed me that I, I learned that in the face of others thinking nothing's possible, we can win. You know, we can actually win big. And now, since that time, there's been over 60 million billion dollars spent 
uh, over 30, I don't know the latest data, it's over 30 million lives have been saved. And that whole architecture that got built for that decade was applied to the COVID response globally. So all that is, that's the same community building on the AIDS uh, effort that we helped pioneer. And it's um, great. I mean, we would have been a lot further behind if we hadn't done that investment. Yeah. You, you talk about this idea of uh, standing for possibility, and it, it feels like uh, a lot like this choosing optimism is a lot like Viktor Frankl's way of, of choosing an attitude, choosing a, you know, um, a, a way of looking at the world. Uh, is, is this optimism at the core of seeing possibility? Okay, so you're digging in a little deeper here. So I think where I'm at on my journey is living into this uh, possibility that I'll describe right here which is that at the core is what I call like love, you know, and I'm driven by what I call the love force. I'm in relationship with the love force. It's a verb. It's not a noun. It's a dynamic energy. It's love. And that is includes self-love. And that includes loving, loving relationships, respectful, safe, trusting relationships with other humans, which is a hard task for all of us. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And then it's loving the community, you know, and seeing ourselves as part of a broader whole, embracing our common humanity and our and our common uh, experience as humans. So that's the love zone. Right. And I feel like as I've learned to I used to hate myself, I had a, a voracious self-hatred system in my uh, in my body, in my soul. We could talk about that in a minute. But you know, I figured this out that I hated myself. So if I didn't transform and uh, kind of work on that, and I've, it's, I've done that for decades now, it's an ongoing journey. But I look in the mirror and go, not so bad, you know, for almost 60, you know, like, you know, you're living a full good life. I'm proud of myself. Agreed. And I'm glad that I'm still alive. I've lost friends that are younger than my age now. So, you know, I just am grateful every day. I do a deep gratitude practice. I do Every day I'm gratituding. It's a critical part of my wake up uh, with my coffee, by the way, and my, <laughs> and my dog, Sky. I have a puppy named Sky Joy and Aww. she and I hike and climb every morning. And uh, she is my inspiration. She's my guru of uh, joy, really. And I live I live uh, in that zone. So, yeah. So then from that, you uh, you it's about generating yourself as optimistic. And so I've identified in myself old patterns of being confused, complacent, complacent, complicit uh, in the face of circumstances like, should I act? Should I not act? Is it right? Is it wrong? You know, can I have any role? What could, what could I do? I'm hopeless. You know, I don't see anything that I can do. And, you know, that's confusion. And I live, I spent a lot of time in that zone. Um, and then uh, being complacent you know, and complicit. Um, you know, that's a tricky thing. There's like two sides of the same coin, you know, like I know about problems and I don't do anything about it. You know, like I knew about the Rwandan genocide where a bunch of people got hacked to death, a million people in 34 days. And uh, like our government did nothing. I didn't do anything. I was fully aware. So that is, uh, you know, complicit and complacency. You know, and I, I look at that now and think of future generations and think, uh, am I being complacent and complicit in the face of the climate emergency that we're facing, you know, and how will our generation be looked at? We have an opportunity to, to do what I call climate transformation and, and optimize our ability to uh, make the planet habitable for humans and other species. Otherwise, we're all gone. So, you know, that is like another big idea. Um, yeah. So yeah. and then when you're when you contain uh, confusion, complacent and complicit, you could be courageous and brave and uh, visionary. Uh, you, you, it unlocks the space, actually, to see the possibility. And then you're waging justice. You know, it's mm. waging love, waging optimism. And then you're out there waging justice, which is speak truth, be bold, serve justice for all and build movements do it with everyone. So, Paul, I want to go back at the very beginning of this. You just started talking. You said you you identified these old patterns and identified that you were in this area of confusion and different pieces. Help help our listeners understand, because I think there's a lot of people that might be stuck in some of these 
confusion patterns and these things that maybe aren't optimal for themselves, but it's really hard sometimes to put that lens back on ourselves to discover what those patterns are. So how did you do that? You, you said you, you discovered these old patterns. How did you go about doing that? And are, are they ways that other people might be able to use themselves? Yeah. I mean, as a young person, uh, you know, through my early years in through my thirties, even I was like aware that I had a kind of very negative uh, operating system, I call it, you know, like <laughs> yeah. my operating system was default negative. And actually all humans are, you know, have that. It's part of our old reptilian brain. It's about our survival brain, our old brain, I call it. Uh, and it's like reptilian. So I call it the, uh, you know, the dragon brain, you know, and we operate as, you know, we have an inner dragon that we evolved from and it is about safety and security. And it's always looking for risk. And it, it, it is default negative, right? And so, like, I lived in this, and I was, like, pretty miserable. I couldn't fall in love. I was, like, uh, self-hatred, like, on, you know, X factor, like, to the nth degree. And uh, I was, like, not a happy person, even though externally you might have looked at me and go, oh, he's, like, uh, whatever, whatever. He is, uh, you know, whatever I might have looked like on the outside. I felt like this dissonance between what was actually seen versus how I was feeling. And, uh, you know, in medical school, they told us you have X billion of neurons and that's it. They don't change. They're fixed and rooted. So now it's like 35 years later. And we now know it's completely opposite of that. We now know of something called neuroplasticity. Yep. That you, We as humans have the power to create neural pathways. We can actually create new neural pathways and we can choose to close down old neural pathways. If you like do a lot of like awareness practice, you can like see the patterns in your mind and then you can choose the ones you want to keep. You can choose the ones you want to go close down and through practices, you can do that. And, you know, the brain actually like has these little clipping neuro clippers. They clip away the patterns that are no longer being used. So like uh, all my complicit, complacent, confused neuron pathways are waning and, you know, and all the possibility and optimism pathways are like flourishing. Like I wake up now default gratitude, you know, that isn't how I used to wake up. So I worked on that. I work on it every day. I think it's a fantastic story. It's a fantastic journey. And at the same time, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with sort of the, the workaday life of this journey. I, I go back to you've been a civil servant basically for many years, you know, you've, you've, you've been, you've been very cause oriented and, and now, you know, you're, you're kind of framing yourself as a movement builder, which I think is fantastic. Like build a movement. Like that's, that's even bigger. Has, have you kind of had that in the back of your mind since, you know, you graduated as a doctor? I mean, how, how long has, has this drive been going in you? Yeah, it started in medical school, actually. No, actually, it started in college. I remember when I was a freshman at Muhlenberg in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, I ran for the student government thing in, as a freshman. And I didn't win. And I, uh, But I thought I did pretty well. The guy who was on the, the head of it was a friend of mine, and he was like, you did pretty good as a freshman. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I never ran again. I just like got off into other science and other stuff like that. Um, but I, I, I had a line called vote Zeitz. He'll fight for your rights. Oh. And, um, you know, I, I sort of like that. I mean, yeah. I like the sound of that. Um, and there was like a poster in the hallway of this, you know, by the cafeteria at, at the college. Then in medical school, um, I love to travel. And I, after college, I traveled in Europe for eight weeks with a dear friend of mine, uh, Professor David Weber at the University of Maryland. And I, I met this uh, beautiful woman from Chicago with beautiful blue eyes. And I was like trying to, I had no money. I literally had no money and I was trying to get to Chicago. So I went to a student meeting of the, of a student osteopathic medical association and they had a meeting in Chicago and they were going to pay for someone to go. So I said, I'll serve in that role. <laughs> um, and I got to go to Chicago. I had dinner with this woman. I met her family and, you know, I fulfilled on that, uh, that dream that I had. And, uh, you know, then, with it, a year later, I became the national president of that organization and served in that role for two years during medical school. And it was a it was a uh, advocacy and movement platform. Like I tried to get resolutions through the uh, big institutions, you know, to uh, ban nuclear weapons, you know, through the AMA and the you know the medical associations. 
Um, I got to travel to Russia, Moscow during that time. Wow. I went to the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War conferences. Mm. Uh, like I had, I just had, oper- I, I, I had this travel bug, you know, I've traveled in 62 countries. So it started, uh, my, my parents, you know, we went to Israel as a young boy, went to Canada, you know, they were travelers. They liked to travel and see other places. So I had that in, you know, ingrained in me as a child and I'm the wandering person in our family, you know, <laughs> But they, those are big ideas. I mean, you started off, you know, nu- ending nuclear, you know, arms and various different pieces. So uh, for many people, it's like, oh, I just want to, you know, have a nice meal and make sure my community is safe. But, hey, you're getting to the bigger piece. Are you saying, I mean, do people have to have these big movement things or where does that level uh, for different people start and where does it end? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a great question. I look at it like within myself, you know, like all the different parts of myself, you know, like let's come together here, unify folks, you know, all of you in me, uh, my inner child, uh, you know, my future self, yeah, uh, my old uh, toxic, angry self, you know, my who I'm being right now self, you know, my physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual self, all that unify. And then in my family, you know, we have a commitment to be uh, living under this mantra, love all, serve all. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, Swami Sakshadananda came up with that. And uh, we have made that our family kind of commitment, our intention. Um, so like we create a culture of that and we're there for each other. And it's it, we work at it. We do talking circles and, you know, we have to have a talking stick to control ourselves, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, it's a, it's a, and then, you know, I think at any institution, a school, a church, a synagogue, whatever, a mosque, um, you know, you're in a community outside of your immediate family and there's movement building there. They have issues. Um, what I'm saying is that if there's something that you care about, you can be committed. That's what waging optimism is. It allows you to make commitments and be courageous in them and 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 keep to your word. Yeah. Hold yourself accountable and be authentic to them. So like, uh, you know, if you want to, it, it could be as local as you want it to be. It's like, I want to clean up the lawn outside my church. So don't go and clean it up yourself. Like get a group of s- stakeholders within the church and write a letter to whoever decides about the lawn cleanup system and Put your demands out there. Put your call to action on a piece of paper. And I bet you it'll work to create a new approach to, to caring for the lawn. Yeah. And if they don't do it right away, keep at it. Like, don't stop. You, know? you might even have to actually get out a piece of paper and use a pen with ink in it. Or just write an email these days. Come on. Or text yeah, yeah. Yeah, do a petition. You know. Well, I'm curious about uh, the, you're, you're here now. You're coming up on your 60th birthday. Could you have been this way, do you think, 30 years ago? Is, and, and, and if so, was there some kind of a catalyst that brought you to this point? Yeah, thank you. Um, absolutely not. I mean, I was, uh, my wife thought I was funny at that time. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I think that I have, like all of us, we're on a journey and we're on our healing journey, as I say. And we're always, I feel like I'm on a journey to, uh, you know, kind of f- man- manifesting my soul's journey whatever that is, I'm exploring that, you know, it's an ongoing exploration. And uh, part of me is like, uh, excited. Like I said, I'm grateful to be alive. I feel like I'm working on four different global and national movements right now. And they're all popping. So something's going on, you know, there's some uh, kind of experience that I'm going through right now, of positive synchronicity, and uh, magical transformation that's happening. I'm doing, I'm only one little person. I'm playing, I'm a catalyst. I'm an enzyme in in a biochemical reaction. And I'm just this ever ready bunny generating possibility, being optimistic, creating space for uh, people to, you know, create the next, uh, our new reality, which is what everyone really, I think is yearning for. So it's fun. I'm having a lot of fun right now. Tell us a little bit about those four initiatives that are starting to pop right now. Give us a little bit of an insight into what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I'm still working on global health and, uh, you know, advancing what I call human well-being. Instead of like looking at it from a disease pr- uh, perspective, like we want to advance life cycle human well-being. And so I'm still very involved in that. I'm doing, you know, the AIDS movement experience plus the COVID response. 
you know, I'm in, I'm in those circles already from my prior work. Um, I spent, after I worked on, after I published Waging Justice, I started really working on the climate emergency. And I'm, I'm joining forces with a group that's launched something called the Global Carbon Removal Partnership. Mm-hmm. Global Carbon Removal Partnership. And, uh, you know, we're advocating uh, with them uh, and that group uh, for what I, we call climate transformation. And climate transformation says that everything that's happening now that's focusing on reducing CO2 emissions, which is called mitigation, like trying to get to net zero, you know, to where we're not emitting more than, you know, we're, we get to net zero. The goal for that is 2050. And so we're like, uh, that's not like kind of fast enough. That's not a good goal. And by the way, all the agreements, the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow Agreement, they're all under this kind of mitigation uh, agenda. And not one target from Paris has been met. Mm. They're all off track. They just they just did auto repeat with Glasgow 2021. Same model, you know, and so it's mitigation and adaptation, like prepare for the worst consequences. So we're, we're already seeing the first phase of consequences and we're totally unprepared with the fires and the, all the other stuff going on. So adaptation is failing as well. So mitigation and adaptation are uninspiring and failing. And so we need a new paradigm. And the paradigm that we're proposing is climate transformation. And we're adding in just a third leg of the stool here called removal, carbon removal. Their humanity, us in the U.S. and globally, in the last 30 years has pumped up 500 trillion tons of CO2 that's already up there right now. There was already... 500 trillion tons from the prior 100 years or, you know, about since the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. So we have a trillion tons of CO2 that's already up there. And that's what's causing the changes right now. And we're still pumping more up there. Right. So it's like a bathtub. If you overfill it, you know, there's too much CO2 up there and uh, we have to remove it at a massive scale and we can do it. It's a multi trillion dollar industry that will emerge over the next decade. And it will, uh, humanity is going to say, we want to uh, take a chance and work towards the possibility that we can ensure the survival of all of humanity and all, and all life as we know it. So let's, that's a possibility that we'll make that, we'll, we'll make that commitment to that. Uh, it's a universal yearning. If we get clear about it, that we want to do that, then we do removal. We do adaptation, removal, and mitigation, ARM, adaptation, removal, and mitigation. The removal pillar of this is not happening. There's no U.S. government policy. There's no global plan. There's no global investment. It's like, I don't know what these people are doing. (laughs) It's like really kind of bizarre. And it also is positive and inspiring. It's like we have a way out instead of the uh, climate hopelessness that I suffer, suffered from until I learned about all this possibility. Now I'm like, let's do it. Like this is the year. Where this is going to, we want to transform this global system to implement climate transformation at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt in November of 2022. This is, uh, it's go time. We can't continue with this other paradigm. So, talk about the, the, uh, your role in opening up the possibilities in this. I dug in for two years. I worked with many organizations, I mapped out the ecosystem. I understood the global architecture. I wa- I tracked the money. How are they programming and trying to move money? And it's all broken and not working. And then they haven't done anything to change that. You know, they roll out, you know, uh, uh, the same strategy. You know, Paris 2015 and Glasgow 2021. It was a, they did the same play, same playbook. It's like we it was like why kind of, why, w- why would they do that? I can't answer for them. I'm just telling you how <laughs> I see it and how many other people see it. And, you know, people in the, around the world and in, in, in Colombia and in Kenya are mobilizing because they're not waiting for the kind of the cats that are controlling the system right now to solve the problem. And they're going to be con- demanding climate transformation. They're living at the front line. Their lives are directly at stake first. All of our lives are at stake, but they're going to be affected first. And literally millions or billions of people's lives will be are being threatened in the near term, not in like some uh, foggy, far off land in our lifespan, in our children's lifespan. This is unfolding now. 
And we're, we've already crossed all the tipping points. We're already like, it's already out of control. We don't know exactly what's happening. We can't predict accurately how this is going to unfold. We don't know. Mm. We've, there were no humans the last time this kind of climate disruption happened. So it's the first time humanity ever had to be around when this kind of thing is going on. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering about this this idea of uh, it's happening in uh, parts of the world that are not not well developed. Uh, there, it's not the United States or or Europe. And yet, you know, we'll look at the the wildfires that we've had in Colorado and and uh, on the West Coast in, in just just the past year or so. Uh, why are these not big enough calling cards to uh, get people to answer the call? <laughs> I mean, if I had the answer to that question, <laughs> what I would say is that my belief is that there has to be a movement and there has to be a clear articulation of possibility. And I believe I'm a strong advocate and total adherent to building in the context of the United States, a cross-partisan movement. Mm -hmm. It has to be an inclusive movement of principled Republicans, Democrats, independents, and all the non-voting Americans. This is an all hands on deck opportunity and it can happen like us versus them. Yeah. And we, we will fail. Uh, we also like, you have to think big about it. Like this is massive. What is possible here? We can't operate it under this constitutional order. So it's directly linked to that. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Kurt, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Mm. I wasn't going. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I know you're, I, where I, wanna... I know where you're going though, Tim. I talk on it. Am I that transparent? You are. I, you are transparent. You guys are way. funny. <laughs> <laughs> funny but, looking but, maybe, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that, anything else. All right. The scary funny, not ha ha funny. But um, <laughs> Paul, we're, uh, you, you've talked about your travels and I'm, I'm curious about um, uh, your love of music. Has, has that been impacted by being in 62 different countries? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm a, an eclectic music person. Um, I don't like I, I like all kinds of music. So I listen to classic music. I listen to jazz. I listen to rock, oldies, you know, uh, Afrobeat, Latin music. You know, so I I remember when I was traveling in Africa, I met this guy who was running around Africa recording tribal music from all these ancient tribes, and we were on some airplane. Wow. From, uh, Johannesburg to London. He's a Brit. He was a Brit. I think he, he passed away for sure. So he, I bought all these CDs off of him with this kind of these recordings of tribal music. Oh, cool. Um, really cool. Really cool stuff. I'm totally deeply inspired by South African music and the liberation movement of the of apartheid and, you know, their commitment to truth and transformation uh, that I'm inspired by and many Americans are. Uh, we think we need a truth commission here in the United States. That's one of the other movements that I'm working on. And yeah, so yeah, musically, yes, I would say you were, I want to share with you that I, I uh, do like repeating of music. So since I was a little boy, I would like, like yeah, are you talking about like repeating one song or yeah, what? one or, song? Yeah. Okay. All right. Even as a little boy with a record and I had a thing and I would blast it and I would repeat the same song over and over <laughs> and over. It drove my mom and dad and my sister crazy. Like as a young boy, I was like the impossible dream was the yeah. song that I did played that over and over and over. Like the Robert a Robert Goulet version, or you I know, don't remember. The, you yeah, okay. like you're that you're stretching beyond beyond my capabilities. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, and then I I do a lot of uh, uh, chanting practices in different languages. Oh. You know, as part of that, as part of like uh, transforming my brain. But lately, I've been listening to Nina Simone's song called Consummation. And uh, it is my, I am like, I could, I drove from uh, Washington to New York yesterday and I literally played it for the four and a half hours over and over. And I highly recommend that you play it. And like, she talks about like the, the, the evolution of humanity that we can get to a place of embracing our common humanity and that we can see that uh, we're, it's joy, a joy field and that the only thing that's really here is love, 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 you know, and it's like it aligns with my experience of our the moment that we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. Isn't it fantastic that uh, in less than four minutes, you can get all that out of a song 
and have it be so compelling that you are willing to listen to it over and over for four hours. I think that that's just magic. I yeah, do. actually, for the last four months, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I sent it out to everyone over the holidays. Like, this was my message, you know. Oh. So so if you were going to be stranded on a desert island, would you think about taking, uh, like, volumes of, uh, of music? Or could you so – let's say you had a year on a desert island. Would you Could you take, like, three songs? What? I would take – can I have my iPhone? I would have <laughs> – Well, no. Let, let's, let's, oh, let's say you only had three songs You to had take. three oh, singles oh, oh, oh. and a record yeah. player. There you go. I, I, I have – I have three. Yeah, I have three. Okay. What, what, what would those, what would those three songs be? Uh, Nina Simone's one of them, the consummation song. Um, there's a, I'm, I was born as a Jew and I'm now, I now consider myself post-denominational or interspiritual, but I, I, I have done a deep dive and I do use Jewish practice. I've done Sufi practice, Muslim practice and Christian practice and Buddhist and Hindu practice. I, you know, I'm a medley of all that also linked to my global travels. So, you know, as, you know, as a being born a Jew, that is like the deepest kind of imprinting. And I have like decided to like ride that wave, you know, that I was like genetically inheriting and experientially programmed by, but put it in context, you know, it's like, you know, there is no one God, there is no chosen people, for example, you know, we're all, it's a common humanity is actually the vision. And so, yeah, so there's a chant that uh, is said in the morning practice, it's called Moda Ani, and it's a gratitude chant. So um, my rabbi mentor teacher, Rabbi Shefa Gold, has an app, which uh, it's called Flavors of Gratefulness, and it has like 120 versions of the Moda Ani. So every day is a new version and, you know, you play, I just play the one that pops up. And then I imagine that people all over the world are listening to that same version. Yeah. And we're collecting on that energy vibe. And that is actually happening, actually. And, uh, you know, it's just like, that's the trick for me to get to the gratitude brain. That is what transformed my brain. Mm. So that song. Okay. And then there's one other Jewish prayer that I am obsessed with right now <laughs> called Avinu Makeno. It's sung at the beginning of the Jewish New Year in uh, the the holiest of holy days, the day uh, Yom Kippur, the day of at one mint atonement. You know, it's day uh-huh. of atonement. But if you pronounce, it's the day of at one mint uh, when you're really connecting with that uh, unity consciousness and that uh, that possibility of embracing our common humanity. There's a song that's sung there where you're calling in the angels and you're calling in prior generations. And I call in future generations. So I do intergenerational uh, connections, you know, through this other song called Avinu Makinu. Oh, Paul, Very fantastic. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a, a guest on Behavioral Grooves. We really appreciate it. And your insights and your, your just the attitude. I just it's infectious. As you said, we are all <laughs> infected with PSYOP right now. And there we go. We're going to be you're going on a suppose and then we're going to it's going to be crazy. So, all right, we're going to spread that joy around the world. Thank you so much. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learn from our discussion with Paul, have a free flowing conversation, and we get to talk about whatever else comes into our super optimistic building movements, crazy ideas, minds. Man, this guy has a fantastic big, there's so much about Paul that I really appreciated. Can I just get one thing out of the way though? Okay. The constitution 2.0 thing that we teed <laughs> up in our uh, grooving session. I think that it's, it's kind of a inflammatory, possibly, possibly even a radical idea. Yeah, it is. Uh, I would say so. No, uh, uh, I mean, this whole idea, like toss it out because it was made by slave owners and, you know, people were designing it to keep women and minorities down while I'm, I just have to say that while I'm sensitive to some of the the ideas, uh, you know, the and the principles, because things happen in context, yeah. right? Yeah. It was written 250 years ago. That's who wrote the document. They can't escape their own context. I just want to say that the idea of actually throwing out our constitution, starting over, seems antithetical to the way that we built a system around it. We've amended it 33 times. We put amendments out. 27 have been ratified. Okay, 27 have been ratified. So, but we're, you know, 
I think that our system has continued to say we need to continue to refine the model, basically. And I think there's an interesting piece here, which is this idea of of do we change from within or do we change from without? And that's a big piece of all of this. And so and again, you know. Right or wrong go, goes back to our, our information, our conversation with David McCraney, right? Uh, two people can look at the exact same, you know, picture of a dress or, you know, the crocs that are on our feet and see two very different things. Yeah. And it's even more so when we talk about some of these big concepts, ideas. So, you know, for some people out there, they don't throw it all out. That is the way that the only way they see that this is moving forward. And for others, it's like, no, we keep it the status quo because that's good. And again, let's use some compassionate curiosity and let's find both sides of this topic and um, then we'll go on there. The one piece I do like that that kind of is brought up by Paul in that piece, though, is this idea of building movements to drive change and that that yeah. if you want to make societal change, even organizational change, that that the way to do that isn't necessarily just by going out and being solo. You have to, you know, build a movement. Yeah. Which gets us into two conversations that I want to refer listeners to the, our discussion with Julie Badalana about uh, about empowering people mm-hmm. to do things. It, it, she has kind of a, a test grid on how to build movements like that. Uh, and then scaling, you know, I think about John List yeah. and bringing ideas to scale. Both of those things are are important for the building building movements that you're really passionate about. Yeah, so fantastic there. One thing, Tim, that I found interesting was his SIPO, you know, self-imposed persistent mm-hmm. optimism. And he, and he talks about this. I love this idea that it's it's highly contagious and how we realize it. Right. Um, um, right. But, you know, he, he kind of realized it himself. But what I find fascinating is that he chose this mindset. Right. Yeah. And, and if you think yeah. about it, it really is a mindset. And and so I love this because, you, you know, me in mindsets, you know, me in priming and, you know, me in all these pieces. Oh, yeah. This is what gets me. Hot I, buttons. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I would I could read and, and learn all day about those things. So. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, I think when we think about mindsets, so mindsets are lenses or frames of mind that orient individuals to particular sets of associations and expectations. That's the that's the way that Crumb, Solovi, and Aker defined it back in 2013 in, in one of the papers that they did. And we've talked about the power of mindsets, that they not only influence how we see the world, but how our body responds to the world, the placebo effect, this idea that you can give somebody a sugar pill and that sugar pill can sometimes have a greater impact on somebody overcoming a disease or you know some sort of issue than an actual active pill because our brains yeah. think, literally, literally, literally actually solve the problem. Our bodies respond differently because yeah. of the way our mindsets are. Aliyah yeah. Crum has done very cool work on this, the physiological response to food, to stress, to other situations. Sean Aker has done cool work on this about our perceived happiness, the a way that the mindset that we have about what is going to make us happy can impact how happy we are and, and what they are. I, all of this is great. Uh, just a quick shout out, listeners. If any of you know Aaliyah Crum, would you please let her know that we want to talk to her? Or, or Sean Aker, both of them. Or, or, yeah, or Sean, either of them. Yeah. Yes. We we really love their work and uh, we would love to talk to those guys. There you go. That, just, just FYI. But uh, again, it gets back to mindsets and this, this whole idea that his mindset is all about this big, bold, holistic view is just fantastic, right? That always stand for possibility. Yeah. I love it. Is is a it's it's a great banner to stand behind. And of course, he doesn't just stand behind it and thump his chest. He, you know, Paul gets out and he gets it done. He, well, re- he really does. And, and I'm not advocating, I don't think you're advocating either that um it's like the secret. If we just, you know, will it to no. be, it will be. But no. we also know that mindsets do impact how we perceive the world, how we respond to the world, um, and thus they impact how we go about doing our day-to-day lives. And I think that's really interesting. And at the same time, you know, he brought up a really important question about identifying your negative operating system. Yeah, that I think is really interesting. And Tim, we talked about this before we started recording, um, but I, I love this idea 
but man, that's hard. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's, it's, we have blind spots that we, you have a number of blind spots. And I think negative operating systems are probably oftentimes in those blind spots. Yeah. Like the David Foster Wallace comment about uh, the, the two fish swimming along and the one says, how's the water today? You know, <laughs> like that. Or, or it reminds me of, you know, I, Danny Kahneman has talked about this when, Someone said, well, with all of the work that you've done in understanding people's biases, have you kind of eliminated some of yours? And he's like, not at all. <laughs> I no. know. No, they're still there. It's, you know, the only way you, you get around them is you change your environment. You change the context. Yeah. Well, and again, it, it just going going all the way back to Fessinger, right? Back in Liam Fessinger yeah. in the 50s and, and yeah. this idea of cognitive dissonance. And you go, oh, you get this cognitive dissonance and therefore you change. No. <laughs> you know, I mean, that happens sometimes. But, you know, but there's this compartmentalizing the negative data. There is this putting a different spin on things, all of these aspects that our brains do a really good job at fooling us. And, so, and, 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 and to try to identify the negative operating systems that are working in our brain is tough work and it's really hard. But it can, there are some things we can do. Oh, okay. What? Okay. Okay. So what can we do, Tim? Well, mindfulness training, oh, right? Okay. You're a meditator, you know, well, and, I, and I tried to be a meditator and then I failed miserably because I'm not a meditator. See, my mindset is telling stop, me this. Stop with the what the hell effect. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, you know, think of yourself as, as a meditator. And, uh, you know, meditation is just a great example of, of that, of being able to, it, you know, it's a, it's a low effort tool to, to bring more uh, mindfulness to your life and, uh, and that that can bleed into other things. Yeah, I think that's a really key piece, right? Having that ability to reflect. We don't reflect often, yeah. right? And so even if it's journaling, doing a daily journal, reflecting back on, on your day, different things. One of the things you can do with that journal is kind of describe the behaviors that you have. And then you can yeah. start searching for those negative patterns and trying to identify what those are. It's kind of a behavioral mapping piece. So you can use a behavioral mapping approach to Great this tool. Great right? tool. Yep. Um, look yep. at your behaviors through an objective lens. If you were a video camera just recording what are you doing what what's the trigger what's the behavior what's the outcome without the emotion that's associated with it now that's hard right and so maybe you need some outside help you need a close friend to help you work through that maybe get past that uh the cognitive dissonance piece where you're just or the confirmation bias that you want to have this good perspective of who you are and what you do so yeah, yeah get some outside help behavioral mapping mindfulness all things that you people can do well, I would just want to add, you know, with that behavior mapping that it's a, it's a, it's a great tool and it's okay to, you know, identify the emotions. It's also a good thing to then sort of question the level of distortion in those emotions, mm -hmm. right? Sort of, you know, where, where am I unconsciously distorting some of the, some of these emotions? Yeah. And I, th and when we ask ourselves that it's surprising how, how much we can come back and go, oh yeah. That was put yourself was like put yourself in the third person, right? This is an totally, interesting piece. The, totally. the the distortion. Like you talk to other like like um people who have maybe are are scared of spiders, right? And they they they're that. And you as a third person looking at that, if you're not afraid of spiders, go. Why are you afraid of spiders? You know they're not going to hurt you. They're small. You can smash them. All these other things. But if you're scared of spiders, you don't you don't rationalize all that away. That's right. But if you put yourself in a third person, what would a outside person say about this? Then that goes and takes you out of your own mindset and, and that can Perfect. help there. Yeah. yeah. The last piece. And I think that we can chat about here unless you have more because you always have more if you really want. But this idea that Paul is going for huge global change the world redo the constitution yes. get rid of aids make children yes. you know hunger a, a, a bygone thing and i just wonder sometimes like god that seems like a lot do i want to go out and change the world <laughs> and, and, and 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 now do i You're feel, get do, tired by the end of the day well, when do you, i when do, you and, but then i feel bad like i'm not going out and trying to change the world oh yeah stop that 
don't don't feel that way. I want to just stop you right there because that's a distortion. Okay. Like that's a shaming thing. We can have so much impact on the world just by changing ourselves, right? Just by personally investing in our own change and the, and the kinds of things that are important for us. So so personal development is really important. It is doing it for your own selfish reasons. I, I think that that's good. Uh, investing in your family okay. is important. Yeah. Right. I mean, man, you've got, you know, two kids at home and a, and a fantastic wife. You have a, a loving nuclear family, as, as George Bush would say. Yeah. Right. And and investing in that is really, really important. And, and then just to go one step further, community. Yeah. Right. You care about your community. You care about the neighborhood that you live in, the block that you live on. Man, it matters to me what what my neighbors have to say. Yeah. And and what's going on? So I, I think those are all really important investments that we can make that are much lower bars than trying to change the world. And, and some I think. Thank you. Thank you, by the way. I think sometimes the way to change the world is actually through those small local changes. Right. That's what ha- that's how change can yeah. actually be implemented. So do you bring up a good point that we don't all have to, you know, end AIDS. We can we can be working on making our our family, ourselves, our block, our city better, our community, our the, the behavioral science enthusiasts who listen to this. We can we can make them more aware. We can we can get them excited and, and give them information and we can improve that worldview um, through the things that we have control over. So, so I would though, and this is something I try to do for myself, but all right. So I'm comfortable like with my personal and family, but maybe I you know going out and trying to make an impact on that, that local community. That's a little scary for me, but ah, okay. I think we ought to all push ourselves. So Groovers, if you're listening, you know, what, where, where do you feel comfortable? And then, you know, can you take that next step? Can you, can you go to the next level and just say, what can I do beyond what my comfort level is? Push yourself, get a little scared, make that, engage others, right? Build a small movement, build a movement on your block, build a movement in your organization, build a movement in, you know, your city, you know, take a point of view and and, and hold that point of view. Now be compassionately curious about, you know, how others view things, but, you know, and then take action, just go and do it. So. Well said. Start a podcast. And start that, a podcast. There you go. Yeah, that's yeah. my recommendation. Okay. All right. I think I think that is a wrap for this episode of Behavioral Grooves. Remember, if you like this episode, got a bit of insight from it, or just like the idea of Behavioral Grooves being out there in the world, bringing these different voices of uh, people um, to other people across the globe, please leave a positive rating, review, or share us with a friend. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode and all the episodes. We hope that you found something useful. Again, apply it in your own life or share it with others. And hopefully there's something that this week you could go out and use it to help you find your groove. 